Up till now, we've used built-in functions as well as functions that have been packaged inside of the libraries that we've installed. This week, we'll create our own functions. So functions are written to be reusable chunks of code that take an input, do something with that input, and return an output. So to begin, I'm going to create a new project and I'll name it function. And I'll create a new script and I'll go ahead and name that function too. So let's see the basic structure of a function. So you start with the function name call the function function, which is a little bit redundant, but in this case, um, we have to call the function. And we, we want to give that function some sort of inputs. And then we'll include our inputs inside these curly brackets or braces. So the braces indicate that the lines of code inside are a group that runs together. And you want a hard return to separate your braces. It makes it easier to uh, read the code and see where the start and end of the function is. And then you'll want to often store the output value in an object name, in an object. And you'll want to do something with those inputs Maybe this is another function like mean, and then you'll return some output value, either as the value itself or you want to print it. And we'll see a few examples of that. So this is the, the standard structure of a function. I'm going to go ahead and comment this out, but I'll leave it on top. So let's look at an example of what the braces are doing. So if we were to write a plus b inside of these braces, if we press run anywhere inside the braces, R understands that this is a group of things that need to run together. So pressing run anywhere in this group runs all the lines within the curly brackets. And a function runs all of the lines of code inside of the curly brackets. And it uses the arguments provided and then returns some output. So let's see an example of a function. Let's call this calc shrub fall. When we want to calculate the, sh the volume of the shrub, let's call the function and we'll give it, we want to give it uh, three inputs, length, width, and height. And then we create these curly brackets. And in that, let's store the output value in an object called volume and it will be calculated as length times width times height. And we want to return the value of volume. So I'm going to run these, these lines and it creates the function. So creating a function doesn't run it. To run it, we need to call the function by its name and provide it with some inputs. So I'm going to call calc shrub vol, and I'm going to give it three inputs because that's what we specified it requiring, length, width, height. So my length is 0 0.8, my width is 1.6, and my height is 2.0. So we, internally, the function is multiplying these input values and then returning the value of this object that it created. 
And oftentimes, instead of returning the value, you want to store the output to use to use it later in the program. So the only things that the function understands are the three inputs that you give it. Well, there were three in this case. So it could be any number of inputs. And the only thing that the program that R understands about the function is the output that it produces. We've seen default arguments in R. We can also set default arguments when we create functions. So let's see an, an example of, of giving our calc shrub volume default arguments by setting them in in this, within these parentheses. And I need those curly brackets and inside the curly brackets, I'm gonna cr create the same, the same volume object, length times width times height, and I'm gonna return the same. And I've got my closed curly brackets, so I'm gonna run this. I'm going to run this. And now I'm going to let's explore what this um, calc shrub ball object returns. When we call this function and we don't provide inputs, it uses the default inputs. Or if we call this function but give it one input, then it overwrites the value for width. It overwrites the default value and uses the other default values. And we can overwrite all the values by specifying these three inputs. Oops, there we go. Or if we wanted to be more explicit, then we could use the input names to specify the input values. And notice how these are not in the same order as the inputs themselves. I, and I didn't run this line. Oh, there we go. So if we don't want to name the inputs, then we need to provide the values in the same order as they're listed in the function. But when we name the arguments, then we can put them in whatever order. So if not using the names, then the order determines the naming. We can also combine functions. We can combine functions that we've created or a mix between built-in functions and functions we create. Each function should be a single conceptual chunk of code. And functions can be combined to do larger tasks in two ways. So let's call multiple functions in a row. Let's create a function called estimate shrub mass. And we'll call the function. And the input we want to give it is the output from our previous function, this volume object. And we want to create an object called mass and store the conversion between mass and volume, which is 2.65 times volume raised to the 0 0.9 power. And there we go. So I'm going to run this. I've created the function. 
Remember, creating the function doesn't actually run it. To run it, we need to call the function itself by its name. So let's create an object and store the result of calc shrub fall. For, we need to give it a length, width, and height. So 0 0.8, 1.6, So now we've created that object. In our environment, we can see the value here. And we can pass that to our uh, second function, est shrub mass, shrub volume. And we can now see that value stored in our environment. Notice how the Input of this lower line was the output of the above line, and that should sound like a great case to use pipes. So we can use pipes with our own functions, where the output from the first function becomes the input or the first argument for the second function. So let's see an example of this with an object called shrub mass. Let's calc shrub fall for 0 0.8, 1.6, and 2.0. Then, let's get that pipe in there. Then, use this value and put it in this other function. Instead of using pipes, you can nest functions. So let's see an example of nesting a function inside of another function. So inside this first function, we want to first use the output of calc shrub volume for this length, width, and height. So it's saying, we're saying first calculate the volume of this first function, right? Using this first function. And then this creates a value, right? 2.56. So then it's the S shrub mass function is going to estimate the shrub mass on this 2.56 value. You can nest functions, but it, be careful with this because it can make the code more difficult to read. And it's not recommended to nest more than two functions because it's very easy to lose track of what's doing what. You can also call functions from inside other functions. And this helps to organize function calls into logical groups. Let's see an example by calling these two functions, calling one of the functions we've created inside this new function called est shrub mass dim. So let's create a function. And the f arguments, uh, we the inputs are length, width, height. We need those curly brackets, and I'm going to do a hard return so I can keep track of what's going inside my function. And I want the val, I want an object called volume to be calc shrub vol length with height. These are the same inputs that are being provided. And I want another object called mass. What happened there? And I want to use this other function, est shrub mass, with our volume. And I want to return the value of mass. All right, we've created our function. You can see it here. You can select these icons here and look at all of the functions that you created. 
So I've created it, and now I want to run the function on some input values. So let's call strubmassdim on, I see in the yellow box, I need a length, width, and height in that order if I'm not going to name them specifically. And now it, when I run this function, it returns the value of 6.17, which was the value of mass. So we assign the function to an, a name, but we don't need to pass the function name anywhere inside the function. And that's one violation of building a function. So it's possible if you're working in a really long script, it's possible to jump between different functions. You can click on the list of functions at the bottom of this window. And sometimes it can be helpful to clearly see what is a function. So our studio has a global option under tools, global options, code, display, highlight our function calls. So let's see that. And, and the highlighting is very subtle because it changes the, the name of the function to this gray color. So to see it more obvious, you'd need to change the appearance to a different editor theme like uh, I don't know, let's try, let's just try this one tomorrow. And now you can see more obvious the, the change in color of the name of the function. So whenever we're calling a function, it changes it to this light blue. So you can play around with different editor themes if you prefer one over the other. So I'm going to leave it at that. I like this purple. So for this week's lab, you'll be building your own functions. A few things to remember that are common, uh, that can cause common errors when building functions is remember your curly brackets and remember your to do your accounting. Make sure your parentheses are closed, are matched by closed if you open one. All right, good luck.